Hi again, everyone. I'm Tony Nichols. I'm the senior pastor at Church Alive in Northwest Arkansas. Today, I want to talk to you about truth versus chaos. If you have your Bible or an electronic device, or if you just want to listen along, let me read to you 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. It says this, All Scripture is inspired, God-breathed, by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. In life, sports, work, even playing games, rules exist. Those who enforce and follow the rules exist. It's interesting, sometimes we live in a world where people say, I don't need any rules. And if you play a game with someone that's always changing the rules, it's no fun. If you're out on the road and there's some crazy driver that feels like he has to weave in and out at 120 miles an hour and is incredibly dangerous, um, it's not enjoyable. Rules exist for a purpose. They give us order. And yet even Jesus said that as we learn the basic rules and the basic truths by which we live, that we're not rule-focused all the time. We begin to relax and we have a different motivation. Let me give you a little illustration. Little boy, six years old, loved football. Uh, he was excited to play in what is a peewee football league for little kids. Helmets, pads, um, felt really big. And so he was the quarterback. And when they hiked or centered the ball to him, he decided that he was going to score a touchdown his way. So he ran to the side, away from kids, ran out of bounds, ran up the steps in the stands. This happened to be in a place that had some concessions up on the upper level, ran around, came down some other steps. Uh, people were just laughing and looking at him like, what is he doing? He finally ran back in bounds and ran into the touchdown and spiked the ball. And he thought, I made a touchdown. When in reality, the moment he stepped out of bounds, the play was over. There are a lot of people like this little boy. They want to do things absolutely their way. It's like, I don't believe in any truth and any standards. I don't believe in any morality. I can do whatever I want. I can say whatever I want. It's not going to hurt anybody else. But the truth is, when we don't live according to some basic truths and standards that God's established, it often hurts many other people. So what's the basis of order in the world and the culture that even doesn't know the Lord yet? The Ten Commandments. Those Ten Commandments are the levels that civil servants use to carry out the law. We have to have some semblance of order. Even keeping the Ten Commandments doesn't bring salvation. The Scripture is clear. It helps us understand we are sinful. We are not perfect in our own strength and ability. We don't measure up, and we need a Savior. But if we didn't have those laws... There would be all sorts of killing and murder and adultery and stealing and lying and cheating. And it would be like, oh, well, it would be very difficult to live in a world like that. Unfortunately, we're becoming more and more like that. And there is tremendous chaos and st storms and problems uh, growing uh, in many people's lives. So here's what happens. Those truths are actually written on our hearts. That's what the scripture says. There's this innate knowing of what begins to be right and wrong. Often we ignore that. If kids aren't disciplined and taught, they grow up very narcissistic and selfish instead of learning to be um, compassionate and becoming thoughtful of other people and learning to obey. But if we teach them what is right and what is wrong and we help them come to know Jesus, after a little while, you're not focusing on these Ten Commandments. Jesus basically encapsulated them in two commandments. You come to a place in which you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you love your neighbor as yourself, your spouse neighbor, your children's neighbor, your neighbors, your work associates, whatever. You begin to love people. And if I love people, I won't lie to them. If I love people, I won't commit adultery. If I love my parents, I won't dishonor them. If I love the Lord, I won't be involved in idolatry and the worship of other things. So as we come to know the Lord, as we have Holy Spirit help, then we begin to learn to live this way of love and we keep the Ten Commandments. 
Let me share quickly how the Word of God, truth, governs our lives, and it is a good, healthy way to live. In this particular passage, it says all Scripture is inspired by God and profitable. And so the Bible, the Scripture, is a love letter. I've talked about this before, in which God expresses His love for us. It's like a Chilton's manual, uh, a manual you used to be able to get for cars before so much computer circuitry and whatever, and it would tell you how things were made, how to repair them, how to get them up in working order again, and the Word of God is a certain amount of a rule book. As we learn to embrace the Scripture and learn how God made things to work, the more we can understand and live that way, the better life is. Let me just give you a little illustration that will help us understand four words I'm about to explain to you. You're driving down a road. It's nice and wide. It has paved shoulders. Um, there are some ditches along the side. And you begin to start going really fast and you sort of lose your attention and maybe you're doing what you shouldn't and that's texting or whatever. And all of a sudden you look up and the road curves a little bit and you run off the road and you end up in the ditch. Well, the hope is nobody is seriously injured, but you can't get your car out of the ditch without some assistance. So you have AAA. You call and they send out a tow truck. And the tow truck comes out and assesses that they can hook on the back and pull you out of the ditch and they can get you situated in such a way that you can get back on the road and you continue to go toward your destination. These four words describe the experience that I just told you about. First of all, the Word of God, the Scripture, is good for teaching. And what teaching is, is the knowledge of God. This is the way things work. This is how a marriage works. This is how the Bible tells you to parent. This is how you manage money God's way. This is what a work ethic is. This is how you serve God with your gifts and talents. This is how you become a good neighbor and so on. So the Word gives you teaching, and it's knowledge that involves application. It's not just head knowledge, but it is knowledge that leads us to a way of living. Reproof. What happens sometimes is, like I said, we're on the road, and we're not paying attention, and we end up in the ditch. Probably, if that happens to you, you don't really want somebody to come along and say, you know, you were texting on your phone, you weren't paying attention, and you ran into the ditch, and that was wrong. That would really irritate us and rankle us, but that's what this word reproof means. It simply means that sometimes the Lord and even people need to point out to us that what we're doing or saying is wrong. Maybe it's a bad attitude. Maybe it's a judgmental or critical spirit. Uh, maybe it's not treating our spouse with the kind of honor and value they deserve or neglecting our children. And so we need reproof. It's wrong. So we run off the road. We call AAA. The tow truck driver comes along and he says, wow. He said, you've really got your car stuck in this ditch. And he said, how'd that happen? And you tell him. And he said, well, that was wrong. So teaching, this is the right way to stay on the road. Reproof, you made a mistake and that was wrong. What is correction? Correction means that this is the truth and here's how you get back on the road of life. And so God is such a God of second and third and fourth chances. If we sin and we admit to him, I was wrong, please forgive me. If we humble ourselves and ask him to change our heart and mind, he helps us get back on track. That's what correction's for. It's not condemnation. It's not shame on you. The Lord's not like that. We do that to one another. Religion does that, that isn't born out of a relationship with Jesus and the love of the Father. What correction does is say to us, I know that you ran off the road. I know what you did was wrong. But because you have humbled yourself and confessed your sin and asked me to change your heart and mind, I gladly forgive you and I want to help you get back on track. That's what correction does. And then the last thing is training in righteousness. And the idea of training is that you learn to do something over and over until it becomes your habit of life. It's the way you think. It becomes the way you speak. It's how you feel for the majority of the time. And it's how you live. It starts out at first um, a little bit laborious because we're learning God's ways. And it's like, wow, I've got to choose the Lord against my flesh and, and my old worldly ways. 
But after you get going for a while, it becomes your first way of thinking, not your second thought. And it becomes the way you live. And wow, does blessing and a good life come your way. Sometimes it takes the experiences of life to teach us. Maybe the Lord speaks to us. Maybe parents speak to us. Maybe you uh, get some teaching in school or at work or even at a church. And you don't always want to listen. It's like, well, I just want to do this another way. My oldest daughter, she's probably, I have to think now, maybe 41 years old. When she was about two and a half, she wanted to touch the wood stove. Sometimes on Sunday afternoons, I would get a big pillow and lay on the floor and I would watch a football game or something like that where the heat was uh, coming off. Uh, we lived in Colorado, it was cold. And she would come and she could feel the heat. And I would say to her, no, honey, don't touch that. It will burn you. It will hurt you. And so at first she sort of looked at me and didn't do it. But one day she just decided, I've got to know this for myself. She wouldn't take my word for it. And so what she did is she reached out her little hand and she touched that stove and it blistered the, the ends of these three fingers and she just cried. You see, God wants us to take his word for it. He wants us to learn the lesson from the word. He wants us to learn the testimony or the witness of other people and that would save us so much grief. But unfortunately, sometimes we just have to learn things by experience. If you've had some tough experiences, know this. If you'll humble yourself and tell the Lord, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I didn't listen, please forgive me. He will be that God of second, third, and fourth chances for you. God is after personal maturity. I cannot tell you what I do not know. So as I'm in the Word and I'm getting the Word in me and I'm learning more and more about this owner's manual called the Holy Bible, <laughs> then... I can take you to places that I know. I can't take you to places I don't know. But once I know what God's Word says and once I live the life, then I can come alongside you, hopefully with humility and encouragement, and say, this is what God says. This is the way. Get back on the road and you'll reach your destination. This is what makes us adequate and equipped for every good work that God has for us. What are some of the things God wants us to learn? Sharing the gospel? sharing truth with people. I've had people come to me and say, my marriage is in trouble, and I'll share with them in the Word what it says. And sometimes they struggle. Well, she did this, and he did this. You have to forgive and focus on what you need to be as a husband or a wife instead of pointing to them. Well, if they just change, I would change. Can I just tell you? Probably not. What the Lord says to us is stay home and deal with your own life. And in the process of you changing, the other person often responds in a more positive way. That's how you have a healthy and successful marriage. How do you raise godly children that are blessing to you and to society? Well, the Word has so much to tell you about that. You love them, you discipline them, you teach them, and you set the example. How do we represent Jesus in the marketplace with a godly, productive work ethic? There have been many days when I got up and thought, I don't really want to go to work today. But because my parents taught me from an early age, you don't live by emotion, you do the next right thing. I learned an early, from an early age, a solid work ethic. I'll soon be 66. I've actually been working uh, for farmers, mowing at a park, whatever, since I was 15 years of age. I've worked 51 years faithfully, and God has provided so wonderfully that I've never not paid a bill, I've never not had a place to, to live or a car to drive or food to eat because part of the work ethic is how God will provide for you. And then what we learn to do from the Word is become an equipper and multiplier in His church. We begin to disciple and mentor people from the Word and from our walk, how to walk in truth and not chaos. Oh, the world we live in is in such a storm and full of chaos. How do you help them? You stay in bounds. You don't run out of bounds like this little boy. You stay in bounds and you teach them how to stay in bounds. You live and work within the boundaries that God has established. It will produce for you the best life. 
I want to be sure you understand that once you come to know Jesus as Savior and Lord and He forgives you and gives you a new life, it doesn't mean that everything will be wonderful and you'll never have a problem the rest of your life. You will have challenges and problems. He'll be with you. You have wisdom to know how to confront and many times overcome and walk out of those circumstances. You have the help of the Holy Spirit and other believers to encourage you. So I'm not saying to you that it's an easy life or a life without challenge. I'm saying to you it's the best life because when you start doing things God's way, you'll overcome chaos. There'll be order and peace. You'll have help from the Lord and people. And the storm and the chaos will be greatly diminished. And the peace and the joy and a life worth living will be greatly increased. Please embrace God's way. God's way works. And instead of living a life of fear and pain and chaos, come to the truth and the truth will set you free. Thanks for your time today. Amen.